John Lee vows to use all legal means to pursue eight self-exiled activists' criminal responsibilities for life. President Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin among leaders addressing the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. And Israel launches its biggest military operation in the occupied West Bank in 20 years. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The National Security Department of the Police has issued arrest warrants for eight self-exiled activists on suspicion of endangering national security, with $1 million rewards for information leading to their arrest. Today, Chief Executive John Lee voiced his support for the police action, saying authorities will be pursuing the fugitives' criminal responsibilities for life. Sharon Tang has our top story. The only way to end the destiny of being an abscondi uh, who will be pursued for life is to surrender. This from Chief Executive John Lee after Hong Kong's National Security Police placed a $1 million bounty on each of the eight self-exiled activists. Among the eight are three former lawmakers, Ted Ho, Nathan Law and Dennis Kwok. Speaking ahead of the weekly Executive Council meeting, Lee called on family members of the wanted persons to provide information to the police. I am in support of the police action. It's not just that this is an important duty they should do, but it is to try to get as much assistance as possible from law-abiding citizens. A lot of them feel a strong responsibility to protect national security. I'm not afraid of any political pressure that is put on us because we do what we believe is right. While the CE said the court would consider more lenient penalties for those who surrender, many absconders have already said on social media that they will not do so. Lee added that any acts that violate the national security law, as well as the forces behind them, will become evidence when the wanted individuals are arrested. Secretary for Security Chris Tang said the fugitives should come back to Hong Kong and surrender themselves. Under the uh, national security law, it is illegal for anyone to aid and to abet and provide financial service to those offenders who have committed offence of under the NS law. It doesn't matter what background are they. In Beijing, the foreign ministry also addressed the matter. After fleeing overseas, they have acted in an even more outrageous way to create trouble and continue to instigate division of the country. Justice will never be late or absent. The Hong Kong police issued arrest warrants for these destabilizing elements in accordance with the national security law. The ministry also urged other countries to stop supporting anti-China forces and that Hong Kong affairs are purely China's internal affairs. Sharon Tang, TVB News. Lawmaker Eunice Young's father-in-law is one of the wanted fugitives. She said she would not hesitate to hand in any information to the authorities. Memo Sangai reports. Lawmaker and barrister Eunice Young's husband is Derek Yoon, the son of one of the wanted persons, Elma Yoon. Yong said she had already reminded her husband to be careful when dealing with his father on financial matters. She had earlier publicly renounced her relationship with her father-in-law, Alma Yoon. Yong said why Alma Yoon is now a fugitive, he is still the father of her husband. Yong described as ridiculous suggestions from some people that she should divorce her husband. To divorce someone because of a national security issue does not respect or understand the meaning of marriage, Yong said. Yong believes Alma Yoon should return to Hong Kong, saying this would give him the opportunity to prove his innocence if he feels he has not violated the law. Will family members of the wanted activists violate any laws by communicating with them? There is no crime by association, which means that the fact that you are related to somebody, that you automatically become a criminal. That's not the case in Hong Kong. The second thing we must remember is that anybody accused of committing a crime in Hong Kong must be proved to have a criminal intent and have committed a criminal act. 
In terms of financial transactions between the two parties, Tong said as long as the sum of money remains small, it would be allowed. But Tong said if it is millions of dollars, then it would be suspicious. Memos 9, TVB News. John Lee also talked about lowering the entry level for the top talent pass scheme, saying applicants do not have to graduate from the top 100 universities in the world. To attract talented people to work in the city, the government launched the top talent pass scheme, planning to import 35,000 people annually. Currently, the number of approved applications has surpassed 35,000. Nonetheless, the CE said authorities plan to further relax the application requirements of the scheme to ensure the city's competitiveness can be maintained. The city celebrated the 26th anniversary of its return to Chinese rule last Saturday. That day also marked the first anniversary of Chief Executive John Lee's administration. Speaking on TVB's Straight Talk program, Lee shared his thoughts on the city's economy and governance. Sharon Tang reports. Cheers. Hong Kong celebrated the 26th anniversary of its return to Chinese rule last Saturday as people got back to normal life after the pandemic. Chief Executive John Lee said on TVB's Straight Talk program that he expects the economy to keep improving for the rest of the year. Some of the measures we have rolled out and some we will be rolling out means that, well, very likely, third quarter will be better than second quarter and the fourth quarter will be better than the third quarter. Right. We estimate that we will have growth of between 3.5 to 5.5 percent. So on the average uh, is around 4.5 percent. The CE insists freedoms in Hong Kong remain intact despite criticisms from overseas. What we need to do is go out and tell the true facts. Independent studies have already uh, given us uh, very clear evidence of what we are. We are the number one freest economy. We are the most friendly uh, business environment city. Lee also said the government is united in sharing his pragmatic approach. We share the same belief that we should be result-oriented. Uh, probably we were too focused on procedures. Yes, procedures right. are important, but at the end of the day, it's not what you do. You can work a lot in the factory, but at the end of the day, it's how many cars you produce, True. how many cans of food that you produce, right. and whether these are good products. The chief executive also talked about how he manages his health despite a busy schedule well, by practicing a type uh, of breathing I exercise. I have been telling people that I'm practicing Qigong. Qigong has the advantage of uh, allowing me to recover right. uh, using even very short period of time. So. People sometimes associate with medi meditation, but it's more than meditation. Right. Sharon Tang, TVB News. President Xi Jinping has urged Shanghai Cooperation Organization members to focus on pragmatic cooperation to speed up economic recovery. He made the call in Beijing while addressing the SCO summit via video link. SCO leaders, including Russian President Vladimir Putin, attended the online summit hosted by India. It marks Putin's first appearance at an international event after a short-lived mutiny last month. Putin said the Russian people were united as never before while thanking the SCO nations for supporting his authorities during the mutiny. At the summit, Iran was accepted as a member, while Belarus is expected to sign a memorandum of obligations that will lead to its membership later. China is set to impose export restrictions on eight gallium and six germanium products from August 1st to protect national security. Analysts see the move as a response to escalating efforts by the United States to curb China's technological advances. It also comes just as Washington announced Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will visit Beijing on Thursday. China is the world's top producer of both gallium and germanium, which are widely used in semiconductors, electric vehicles and high-tech industries. According to the Chinese Foreign Ministry, the export controls are in accordance with law and are not targeted at any country. Analysts said the new measures look set to tighten overseas supply and push up prices for buyers in the near term. 
It comes as Washington considers new restrictions on the shipment of high-tech microchips to China following a series of curbs in recent years. At least 10 Palestinians have been killed and hundreds wounded after Israeli forces hit the refugee camp in Jenin with drone strikes during an overnight operation. Hundreds of Israeli troops entered the city in the occupied West Bank as gun battles raged for a whole day. Around 3,000 people have fled the area, with Israel saying the operation may last up to two days. Nazvi Karim with more. Fleeing from a refugee city that their grandparents fled to 70 years ago, around 3,000 people have been evacuated from the West Bank city of Jenin after Israel conducted its most intense military operation at the refugee camp in two decades. Israeli officials said the military is close to completing its objectives after a raid involving hundreds of commandos backed by drones. The goal was to destroy what they say are Iran-backed Palestinian armed factions responsible for a recent surge in gun and bomb attacks. Islamic Jihad said they lost four members, while one of the dead belonged to Hamas, the party that governs the Gaza Strip. The dead were aged 17 to 23. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Jenin has become a haven for terrorism in recent months and his forces are putting an end to it. Around 14,000 people live in the refugee camp, an area less than half a square kilometre. The camp was formed in 1953 to house Palestinians expelled from their homes during the 1948 war. So far in 2023, Israel has destroyed 290 structures in the occupied West Bank, displacing families while settler violence has also increased. Jordan, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates, along with the 57-nation Organization of Islamic Countries, condemned the raid. At the UN, spokesperson Farhan Haq read a statement from Middle East coordinator Tor Wenesland. All must ensure that the civilian population is protected, he said. From the outset, Mr. Venisland has been in direct contact with all relevant parties to urgently de-escalate the situation and ensure humanitarian access and delivery of nece necessary medical and other supplies into Jenin. The United States said Israel had a right to defend itself. <inaudible> Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas appealed to the international leaders to condemn Israel's attack and to impose penalties against the occupation regime. More than 150 Palestinians and around 50 Israelis have been killed so far this year. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. An award-winning Ukrainian writer was among those killed by a deadly Russian missile attack last week on a restaurant in Kramatorsk in Donetsk. 37-year-old Victoria Amelina, a writer of novels and children's books, was in the restaurant frequented by journalists when it was hit. Amelina had turned her attention from literature to document Russian war crimes after the invasion, according to PEN America. At least 11 others were killed and 61 wounded in the attack around dinner time, when the restaurant was usually busy. She was there with a group of Colombian journalists and writers. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, in his nightly address, said his country's air defenses are not enough to protect against Russian attacks. This as Russia accused Ukraine of attacking Moscow with five drones that were either shot down or jammed. Still ahead, crowds gather outside town halls across France in support of the government after days of rioting. Japan wins the approval of the UN nuclear watchdog for its plan to release radioactive water from the Fukushima power plant into the ocean. And a scientific apparatus jointly created by several local universities to monitor radioactive contamination. Welcome back. In France, crowds gathered outside town halls across the country to show solidarity with local governments. This after a wave of rioting triggered by the fatal shooting of a 17-year-old driver of North African descent by police a week ago. 
Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron made a surprise visit to a northern Paris district to thank security officials for their work. Tracy Furness has more. Hundreds of people gathered in the southern suburb of Paris, Les La Rosse, to support Mayor Vincent Jean Brun after rioters crashed a burning car into his home Sunday, injuring his wife and one of his children. The mayor thanked the crowd for their support and solidarity, as well as those gathered in front of all city halls across France. He also slammed the rioters who attacked his family, calling them assassins, but went on to praise his wife for saving his son and daughter from the flames. Outside the town hall of Nanterre, a western suburb of Paris, where 17-year-old Nahel was shot dead by police last week, Mayor Patrick Jarry said violence in Nanterre had subsided. He spoke about the immense emotion that has run through the town over the killing. C'est le meurtre de Nahel dans les conditions this 50-year-old Nanterre resident and father said Nahel was in his son's class and he knew him. It breaks your heart to lose a 17-year-old child like that, he said. The average age of the 3,354 people arrested in the riots over the past week was 17, the interior minister said. President Macron was meeting with mayors of 220 towns which were hit by violence. Across France, 34 buildings, most of them government offices, were attacked along with 297 vehicles. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne met with party leaders from the French Senate and National Assembly Monday. She told journalists that issues such as the role of schools and parental authority and responsibility were raised, as was a return to security and order in the country. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Japan has won approval from the UN's nuclear watchdog for its plan to release treated radioactive water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima nuclear power plant into the ocean. That's despite fierce resistance from neighboring countries and some local residents. International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, Chief Rafael Grossi began a four-day visit to Japan Tuesday when he met with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, delivering the results of the agency's two-year safety review. IAEA will set up permanent station at Fukushima, Grossi said. This as neighboring countries and some locals oppose the action. In Beijing, the foreign ministry expressed regret over the hasty release of the UN nuclear watchdog's report on Japan's plan to release treated radioactive water from the tsunami-wrecked Fukushima plant into the ocean. Japan has not specified a date to start the water release, which will take 30 to 40 years to complete. With Japan planning to release treated radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean soon, a lot of people are concerned. A study jointly conducted by the Education University of Hong Kong, City University and HKU created a scientific apparatus which is believed to be a reliable and cost-efficient way to monitor radioactive contamination. Veronica Lin reports. Despite widespread international objections, Japan earlier announced that it would dump treated radioactive water from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific Ocean. Many are worried about the potential damage to the environment, as well as seafood. While the exact impact is unknown, Professor Rudolf Wu from Education University said even a small amount can be devastating. The effect of radioactive water could worsen contamination via bioaccumulation, which adds up over time as it passes through the food chain. The bioaccumulation of this radionuclide is often neglected. That is to say, even if you discharge very low concentration of uh, radionuclide into the environment, because of bioaccumulation, the phytoplankton can take it up for more than 100 times. And when the zooplankton is the phytoplankton, the concentration will increase by another 100 times. And when they reach the fish, and then they will con concentrate for a lot, um, many times. To detect radioactive substances, Professor Wu invented a scientific apparatus called artificial muscles. Similar to natural muscles, the apparatus is highly sensitive and can soak up a variety of metallic pollutants. The team will leave these muscles in seawater for seven to eight weeks to complete the absorption process. After that, they'll retrieve them and analyze the concentration of contaminants in the lab. 
All this at a price of just $8 per capsule. Through diffusion, the powder inside these artificial muscles will clamp down on heavy metals and radioactive materials. They claim to be much cheaper, but just as accurate as traditional testing methods. Ron Kling, TVB News. That is the news. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.